Welcome to you all. Thank you for coming on this cold night. And uh, I think you're going to have a fascinating journey through the current concepts in cardiology. I'm Dr. Carolyn Lineber, and I'm really delighted tonight to have Dr. Alini here from Presbyterian Heart Group, who is doing for the last four years, I think, some of these really exciting procedures that weren't invented when I came out of medical school. So um, I think you're going to find this an outstanding program. I want to introduce Dr. Kaden Alini, who actually is kind of from New Mexico. Uh, he did his undergraduate at uh, um, New Mexico Tech, or, uh, yeah, New Mexico Tech, and then he did his Doctor of Medicine at the University of New Mexico Medical School. He went off to do, um, he did an internal medicine residency also in New Mexico, and then he went off to Los Angeles to do a lot of cardiology, and he's boarded in several different areas, including interventional cardiology and all of this uh, Sky Wars, uh, fascinating uh, things that are being done in cardiology. It's so exciting to be in cardiology right now. You know, we can help people that we couldn't help years ago. Dr. Alini is operating on 91 and 94 year old people who then have a better quality of life. So uh, it's pretty exciting and uh, he, has, he is the current medical director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory at Presbyterian Hospital downtown. And so, Dr. Alini, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Lineberg. Um, I guess, should I sit here? Is this the best place to... Um, so welcome, thank you for... Uh, coming tonight and attending. Um, and thank you for the wonderful introduction and inviting me out here. Is everyone able to hear me okay? Is it a little loud? Is that better here? So I have, I have a loud voice, so if I'm not talking loud enough, just uh, um, tell me to, to speak up. So no, uh, I appreciate Dr. Lindenberg inviting me up to, uh, to talk tonight. I'm going to just try to go through a few things that are... Um, have, it, a few advances, I guess, in uh, cardiology and um, cardiac care um, that have taken place here over the last 10 plus years. And uh, I wish I had hours to talk because there's all sorts of other things um, that I had hoped to go over as well, just not enough time. There's, there's a lot of uh, exciting stuff going on in medicine uh, overall, and um, it's a real exciting time to be in cardiology as well as just in medicine overall. I think they sent out a talking point um, if you can advance the slide. Sorry, I'm going to have to ask her to advance things. So I have no disclosures. Um, uh, that it includes a little outline. And really, we'll only go over the top two uh, main areas. I don't think we'll have enough time to go over the bottom area, which is also another exciting area with lots of um, uh, changes. But we're going to really go over um, some advances in valvular heart disease, um, talking about two main valve uh, areas, and then go over um, some advances in atrial fibrillation care that's taken place. As far as the normal heart anatomy, just to get everyone a little oriented so we know what we're talking about, you know, the heart is a, is a pump that basically um, serves to pump our blood uh, throughout our, our, our body to pump nutrients and oxygen to our organs and then um, take them back to our lungs and do gas exchange. And it does this you know, a billion times over our lifetime. So it does, you know, it's, it's a pretty active machine. It has four main chambers, two top chambers called atrium, which are kind of filling chambers, and two main pumping chambers called ventricles. Um, and we divide it into a right and left side. So our blue deoxygenated venous blood comes in to the right side of the heart, um, goes through two valves and out to the lungs where it does gas exchange and it gets oxygen. And then the red oxygenated blood comes to the left side of the heart. 
and goes over two valves that I'm going to talk about. The first is the mitral valve, so that the left atrium fills with blood from the lungs, takes it down through the mitral valve um, into the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle, which then squeezes, and when the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle squeezes, the mitral valve then closes to prevent blood from going backwards, and then the aortic valve opens to allow blood to go forward to the aorta, which then allows, you know, it acts as a passage to send blood to all our organs, including our brain, which you see some neck vessels there, and then downward um, to all our organs. So that's the main function. In health, the, the heart's an amazing structure, um, but there's a lot of disease processes that can affect it. There's congenital issues that we're born with that can affect us when we're young or may not be a problem until we're older. Um, but more importantly, over time, there's a lot of wear and tear that can happen, and so the heart can lead to dysfunction, and there's a variety of things that can affect it. The two areas I'm going to talk about when it comes to valvular heart disease, um, the first is this aortic stenosis. And really what it is, is, is a degeneration of the aortic valve that leads to thickening and calcification where the valve is an opening well. And it's the most common heart valve problem that receives an operation in the U.S. Um, and it accounts for over two-thirds of, of uh, all heart valve surgeries. There's three main types, um, bicuspid, which is really, so the aortic valve, which I'll show some pictures to you, is a three leaflet structure. Um, and in about one to two percent of the population, they're only born with two leaflets. So two of the leaflets are fused together and effectively they have one large leaflet and one smaller leaflet. And that's called a bicuspid valve. It's a congenital anomaly. Those folks usually have a heart murmur when they're born and they're told in childhood they have a heart murmur, but it's of no consequence to, for most of them until they get into their 40s, 50s, or 60s. Um, the more common type of aortic stenosis is calcific or degenerative, and this is kind of the normal wear and tear that occurs, and this is more common in our 70s and 80s, and it affects anywhere from 3 to 10% of folks in there, you know, um, that are elderly. And then rheumatic is still one of the most common worldwide, but less common in uh, developed nations uh, related to rheumatic fever. And these are some pictures on the left. You can see um, the aortic valve in health. Uh, up top is a three leaflet valve. Down below it, um, is, you can see the fusion with kind of an abnormal, they call it a fish mouth opening in that bicuspid valve. And over on the right is the depiction showing a calcified uh, degenerative valve. You even get fusion, um, and it leads to a narrowing. So the valve doesn't open well, and the heart has trouble getting adequate blood flow through that small narrowing. Um, next slide. And these are actual pathologic specimens showing it. Um, again, the most common on the right. Um, you can see these, this bulky calcium that's present and the thickening of the leaflets that, that are present. Um, that leads to that narrowing, the rheumatic right in the middle. You can, again, you can see that narrowing. The, if I had a pointer, I'd show you, but I mean, really the entire thing should be wide open, and really all you have is this really uh, kind of pinhole narrowing. Next slide. Because of a variety of things, um, <coughs> including um, taking better care of ourselves, better nutrition, um, advances in healthcare, you know, the elderly population con continues to increase. If you look at the graph on the right, there's a, this is U.S. Census data showing projections of the elderly population, which they consider anyone over 65 for this, um, continues to increase. And if you look at the far right, that shows projections of 2050, and it's, you know, up to 75% seven, uh, increase just in that 30 years of our elderly population. Because this aortic valve condition is a condition of aging, we're going to see a lot more aortic stenosis. And it's estimated that about 7% of the elderly population have some degree of aortic stenosis. Next slide. As far as what are the consequences of this early on, when people have just mild or moderate aortic stenosis, usually they're completely unaware of it. The only reason it's even noted is um, their physician hears a heart murmur and, and may make notice of it. Sometimes very early on, you may not even hear the heart murmur. Um, 
But after it progresses and once it gets severe, um, that narrowing then obstructs flow, and so you have lack of blood and oxygen getting to your organs, and the heart's having to work really hard to um, get that blood out. And so often people will notice shortness of breath, especially with, with exercise. And they'll notice decreased exercise tolerance. The tricky part here is because this is a condition in older folks, a lot of times the, the first thing they do is blame it on I'm just getting older. You know, I, I, yeah, I can't do now what I did a year ago, but it's just because I'm a year older. And that's usually a telltale sign. So really trying to tease out um, uh, significant changes is, is a concern. Because once people have symptoms some, with this valve problem, something should generally be done about it. Classic symptoms, if, you'll, if it's allowed to progress, uh, include uh, exertional chest discomfort or chest pain, we call angina. Um, and then feeling dizzy or lightheaded, especially with exertion, um, or even having frank passing out spells with exertion. And again, it has to do with a supply-demand mismatch. As you're exercising or exerting yourself, the organs demand more blood flow. The heart can't provide it because of this fi fixed obstruction from the valve condition. And then if it's allowed to progress further, people can develop congestive heart failure. Most common way it's diagnosed, again, is a heart murmur noted on exam. But then once that's noted, generally folks are sent for what's called an echocardiogram, which is a special ultrasound of the heart um, that can really define how bad the valve is, um, along with seeing how the heart is compensating for this. And we use, based on that echocardiogram, we really use how fast the flow is to guide how severe the valve is. So as the valve gets tighter and tighter, the stenosis gets more severe, the velocities or the flow through that valve goes, goes up. And so we have criteria we use to guide us how severe it is. Um, next slide. And these are two um, echo images. On, the, on your left side is a, a, a normal echocardiogram. You're not used to seeing these structures, but Essentially, the main thing, if you can play that one more time, the loop on the, the left. Um, but that's the main pumping chamber, the left ventricle. The valve leaflets are very nice and healthy appearing and thin and open widely. And on the right side, they've zoomed in on a person with aortic stenosis. Um, and you can see that valve is heavily calcified if it was playing, it, we could see that it's actually not opening very well. Um, and that's the typical finding on echo. Next slide. Kind of pointed out the, the aortic valve. So this is the, the stenotic aortic valve. You can see it's really thick here um, and really not opening very well. And when they play here, the aortic valve is the above structure. The bottom valve is the mitral valve. Um, that aortic valve, nice thin leaflets that are opening widely, you know, basically the same size as the aorta here. As far as the natural history with people that have aortic stenosis, it is a progressive condition. So even if you have mild or moderate aortic stenosis, it is something that's going to get worse over time. Um, and how fast it gets worse is a little bit um, less predictable, especially when it's mild. But once it reaches moderate, it tends to be a little bit faster progression over the course of a few years until it um, gets more severe. People that have severe aortic stenosis, just because you have that doesn't mean you need something done about it immediately. Um, you need to see your doctor, get close follow-up, and get serial echocardiograms and really watch for symptoms. But if you're not having symptoms, you're active, you're feeling fine, it can be watched. And we know that because at least natural history studies looking at it, it if you don't have symptoms, the natural history is, or people do just as well as the general population. Once people get symptoms, though, they essentially fall off a cliff and they don't do well. And, you know, early treatment is important with, with valve replacement. Medical therapy is, is not... Um, is, is, is uh, not very useful. And, it, and there's really nothing, med medical-wise, they've done all sorts of studies looking at ways to try to reduce pro progression, looking at cholesterol-lowering drugs, some anti-inflammatory medications, and most of it has really not panned out to, to reduce the rate of progression. And it's still an area of, uh, that's been heavily studied, looking at 
you know, different kinds of uh, regimens, you know, if there's something you can do to decalcify it or reduce calcium deposition. Because once the calcium does deposit, it does become, again, a progressive kind of thing that it, 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 uh, begets itself. Once patients have symptoms, the classic teaching was if they have chest discomfort, shortness of breath, or angina, you know, the median survival was about five years. If they've had passing out spells, three years, and if they have heart failure, two years. More recent data suggests that outcomes are actually probably worse than that, with about a 50% median survival for all comers once they have symptoms. And if you can go next slide. Um, and this graph kind of depicts, you know, this you know, latent period with aortic stenosis, as long as someone's asymptomatic, they do well. Survival is on the left, um, so, you know, the survival curve is pretty flat until they develop symptoms. Once they develop symptoms, um, they kind of fall off a cliff. And down below, that's year, uh, time and years. Next slide. Um, so treatment, the still mainstay treatment and gold standard is uh, surgical aortic valve replacement. Now that we have this thing that I'm going to talk about called TAVR, um, we now refer it often as SAVR instead of, uh, you know, just a aortic valve replacement or AVR, which is what we used to say for years. Um, it's, again, the most common valve heart surgery performed with over 80,000 operations in the U.S. a year. Average mortality, when you look at all comers, is about 1% to 2%, for, which for cardiac surgery is low, low risk. Um, however, about a third of patients with severe aortic stenosis never get surgery. 10 or 20% of them are felt to be too sick, so they've been turned down by surgeons and, um, uh, because of their underlying comorbidities or their age. And then even a bigger population is never sent for surgery because either they feel they're too old, their primary feels they're too old, um, you know, or, or, or you know, just kind of misinformation about it. This transcatheter aortic valve replacement, which is um, what I'm going to focus on now, or what we call TAVR, um, is really was brought on as an option for patients that were too high risk um, uh, for an open operation. And it really came about um, through a guy named Alain Curbier. He's a surgeon uh, based out of France, and he knew this condition was in uh, older patients. He saw lots of older patients that he would operate on, and it would take him a long time to recover. Um, and there were patients he would turn down that he knew if there was a better, you know, easier way that he could buy them several more years of decent quality of life. And so he worked closely with one of the valve companies and he came up with this idea of this transcatheter valve replacement. So it was actually a surgeon that uh, came up with this. And then this is a picture of him. That's actually the first patient that had a TAVR valve. And this was in 2002. So we, although I'm here talking to you about as a new technology, um, in Europe the first implant was in 2002. Now it took many, many years for it to be approved in Europe and studied and and um, become well developed. And then, as usual in medicine, the U.S. is a laggard, which is, and sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing, but um, you know, it took us even longer, and I'll show you a timeline about that. The valve you saw in that last picture is the original um, valve he designed. The original Edwards valve that was approved and first used in the United States is based on that same design. Um, with some mild modifications. But basically, um, you know, there's two main types of uh, transcatheter aortic valves that we use nowadays. There's two, there's only two types in the U.S., but the two main systems, one is what we call a balloon expandable valve, which is what this is. And you can see down on the picture below, this is actually the delivery system. There's a balloon that's already inflated, that's inflated this this uh, valve system. And basically what the valve system involves is a stent frame. That stent frame serves two purposes. One is to push that old crusty aortic valve to the side to uh, provide a good, good uh, new opening. Because with this procedure, you're not taking out the old valve like surgery. This procedure, you're pushing it to the side. The other thing it serves is as a scaffold for the new um, valve to immediately start working. And these are bioprosthetic valves. In this case, this is bovine pericardium. The other valve is porcine. Um, but essentially, this system is crimped down on this balloon when it, the balloon's deflated. 
to allow it to be smaller and to allow us to pass it through the vascular system back across your native aortic valve. And then when you inflate the balloon in valve system, you push your, the old valve to the side, you deflate the balloon, you pull the system out, and you have a newly functioning valve uh, that starts working immediately. If you can go forward. As far as approaches to getting this valve up to the um, uh, aortic valve, um, there's a variety of approaches. The mainstay nowadays with the new delivery systems, the new smaller and better systems, um, is what, through what we call a transfemoral approach. So we go through the femoral artery right in the groin area. Um, and we don't actually ha generally have to make an incision. We put a needle and use catheters um, that start off fairly small, but then the final system is about the size of your pinky um, that sits in the the femoral artery up into the aorta, and then we're able to pass that delivery system that has the valve mounted on it through that catheter um, up and uh, into your native aortic valve. That's the preferred approach. It's the safest approach. Um, but some people have blockage issues or their vessels are too small to accommodate that. So there are other approaches. Um, and those include using what's called the subclavian artery up in the, the that goes out to your, to your arm, the upper chest part. And then more invasive approaches that are still um, an option for people that really don't have good vessels to access include making a smaller incision in the sternum to visualize the aorta and putting it directly through the aorta, just six or eight centimeters below into the valve, or going through um, a little small incision between the ribs through the actual um, heart muscle itself. That's called transapical. With the early systems, because they were much larger and bulkier, um, in our experience, about half of the procedures were done through the groin, and about half of them were done through some other more aggressive approach. With the newer systems, because they've become so much smaller and so much safer, it's about 85 or 90 percent of the time we're able to do everything through the groin. If we can't, usually we try to go through the arm, and if we can't, then these other ones are, you know, single digits as far as the number of folks that need it through a more aggressive approach. And this just kind of shows the, um, the, the transfemoral approach. Um, it is, again, the preferred approach. It can actually be done in a cath lab. It doesn't have to be done in an operating room. A lot of centers, including ours, do it in what's called a hybrid OR. It's basically a cath lab that serves as an OR as well. So you can do these procedures. Um, you could do heart caths, or you can actually do an open operation in there. Um, it can be done with, uh, without general anesthesia, although most centers still in the US are, are generally using general anesthesia. Over the last couple of years, the push has been to try to use um, conscious sedation or kind of deep sedation techniques. Um, and the only problem with it is if, if they have what we call peripheral arterial disease or blockage issues or too small of vessels to get through there. And this just shows a couple of, talks about it, the, the other approaches I already talked about. So go forward. This shows the current valves approved in the U.S. Um, on the left side is the balloon expandable uh, third generation Edwards Sapien valve called the S3. And they've made some modifications. And on the right side you can see this is a a much bulkier valve, and that's the other type of valve system that I kind of skipped over, and that's what's called a self-expanding valve. It's made of special material called nitinol. Um, nitinol is a real interesting uh, alloy that um, has a lot of different interesting properties, but the biggest one is when you conform it to the shape that is desired, um, you can, it acts almost like, like a spring. It, you, can, you can compress it, and it will want to go back to that original shape. Um, unlike a lot of metals, when you compress them, you, you, you fatigue it, and it, it basically collapses. This wants to spring back to its normal shape. It was used a lot, and it's still used a lot in other um, um, interventional realms and other vascular beds, like the carotid arteries. Um, and peripheral interventions down in the legs where you're opening up blocked vessels in the legs. But this is the other kind of leading um, valve system. It has some unique designs. Um, one of the reasons for this bulkiness and how, how tall it is, is it, it is also what we call a super annular valve. So the balloon expandable valve on the left sits right where your old valve is. The valve on the right, even though the system, the bottom of the system sits right where your valve is, the new functioning valve sits actually higher. 
Um, and it's felt that that leads to what we call better hemodynamics. There's a bigger opening there, and, uh, and um, so you, you get better flow, uh, which can lead to better outcomes. This just kind of shows you um, where, where we've gone with the Edwards system um, and how the, the systems have gotten smaller. So on the left, this 22F is 22 French, really, size. The bigger the French size, the bigger the catheter is. So the original system was about the size of your uh, pointer finger. Um, and as it's gotten smaller now, it's about the size of your pinky. And that's what's allowed us, it's allowed a lot of different things. One, it's allowed more people to get it through the groin. Uh, through that transfer or the femoral artery, which is a lot safer approach. Two, it's led to less vascular complications. A smaller system means less trauma to the vessel. It also has led to lower stroke rates. So a smaller system is easier to cross the, the native, this bulky native aortic valve that's there. And so it's led to lower stroke rates, basically lower complications and um, a lot more uh, patients that are eligible through that traditional transfemoral approach forward. And this shows that third generation system. They've also done some other things to try to reduce the leakiness. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of complexities that go on with these valves um, that are slightly different than uh, aortic valve replacement surgery, um, where they actually go in and take out your old valve and sew in a new valve. With these approved, I mean, this just kind of reiterates what I already mentioned, you know, lower stroke rates, actually lower vascular complications, even lower mortality um, rates. Um, with this newer system, the one thing, because of the, they added this skirt to help leakiness, there's a little bit of a higher pacemaker rate. And that's one of the things, actually, anyone that needs aortic valve replacement, the, the conduction system of our body, the electrical system of the body, runs very close um, to our aortic valve, just below it in the left ventricle. And anytime you're messing around in that area, you can disrupt that conduction system. So one of the leading complications of this procedure is need for a permanent pacemaker. And depending on the valve system, it's anywhere from about 8 to 20% chance of needing a permanent pacemaker after the procedure. With an open operation, that was, it's still a problem, but it's lower, probably on the order of 5 to 6% of folks end up needing a permanent pacemaker. And this kind of shows the, the timeline with the Edwards system. Um, so the landmark trial that I'm going to show just a couple of slides on um, was called the Partner Trial, um, which was published in the New England Journal. And that's really what led to this system being approved um, for, for use in the United States. It took about a year and a half for, after that publication for it to be FDA approved. It was originally for patients that weren't candidates for an open operation. And then they lowered it to high-risk patients. We did our first implant um, in 2013 um, with this uh, same system. And then it went through its second generation. And we're currently on the third generation. And the third generation system has been studied against head-to-head -head against surgery um, in what we call intermediate risk patients. So they are kind of pushing the bar in terms of which patients should receive this. The bulk of patients with aortic stenosis or what we would call low risk for an open operation. And it's all, all also being studied currently um, at several centers across the country to see um, uh, how it does against an, an open operation. But right now, it's, on, it's only approved for folks that are intermediate to high risk. Next slide. So with the partner trial, I'm not going to go into lots of details, but really they looked at two different groups of patients. One group of patients that were too high risk for an operation, what they call the non-operable uh, or inoperable patients, and they randomized those to traditional medical therapy and other aggressive things, including ballooning the aortic valve, which we, they did a lot of back in the 90s, um, versus this uh, TAVR valve. And when they did that, when, you know, in, that, in that cohort of patients, what they saw was about a 25% reduction in mortality. Um, now, you can see these are sicker and older patients with lots of comorbidities. So even the group that got the TAVR, there was a, upwards of 40% mortality at two years, but it was about a 25% absolute reduction in mortality compared to the folks that were treated medically. The thing this doesn't show is um, heart failure readmissions, um, you know, patients being and, and heart failure hospitalizations were dramatically reduced. And actually, they've even done cost analysis based on this early um, study, because you say, well, 
you know, should we be using this technology? You know, maybe maybe we shouldn't be doing this on folks at the in the uh, last years of life. And even in when they, when they did a cost analysis, actually, the the you, uh, doing doing the valve system, it, it's not. I guess what I get uh, what I get at is, it was the cost favor favor doing the procedure, um, because getting hospitalized for heart failure, having you know all those things that uh, it, it involves is not a um, benign thing and it, it costs a lot of money to the system as well. Next slide. So the other group they looked at, uh, which they call cohort A, were patients that were high risk. They weren't not operable candidates, but high risk patients, and they randomized them to TAVR versus an open operation. And what they saw in that arm was there was really no difference um, uh, between surgery, and that was sustained. So it was not inferior to surgery, and that's really what's um, uh, caught on and, and moved things forward. Next slide. When they looked at the, inter they, so they pushed this to intermediate and high-risk patients in the Partner 2 trial, um, and originally this started with a second-generation system, the XT system, which was not nearly as good as the S3. And then when the S3 became available, the third-generation system, that was included in all the data. Um, and when they looked at, again, this uh, more intermediate risk population, uh, they didn't see any difference in mortality or disabling stroke between surgery or TAVR. Because that was the original, there, there was a lot of press, oh, the, there's more strokes, people have more strokes, you should have an open operation. Um, and there's strokes with open operations too. And there are strokes that happen with this procedure, but, um, you know, either, either procedure's not benign when you're working on older folks with a calcified aorta and calcified aortic valve. You can push the button, it's not showing the, those are hard to see, sorry, it's yellow, but this shows it, it was not inferior if you go forward, um, and if, if you look at just the patients that received the third generation Edwards valve, um, they actually, against surgery, they actually showed less strokes in the TAVR arm versus surgery and lower mortality that was sustained. Go forward, this shows the mortality, same thing. And this was surprising, and this, this led to rapid approval of it for intermediate risk patients. So the other FDA-approved valve system in the U.S. is the Medtronic system, which I showed you a, a picture of earlier. They've also gone through three generations. They were, as far as timeline-wise, they were just a little bit behind um, the Edwards system. Interestingly enough, the Edwards folks, there was some patent infringement and stuff. There was actually a billion dollar lawsuit that Medtronic lost related to patent infringement and things, but um, uh, you know, th this is the, the other system that, the, that's out there, and it's made of that nitinol that I was mentioning. And the big advantage of it early on compared to the original, the, its original system versus the Edwards original system was it was smaller. So it was 18 French as opposed to that 22 French. And when they did their study looking at these high-risk patients, they actually showed um, mortality um, benefit versus surgery. So it was not just non-inferior, it was superior to surgery in that high-risk patient, patient population. So we know the smaller the delivery system, the better. Go forward. And this just kind of shows that the, the TAVR patients were the yellow and the surgical arm was the blue. Go forward. And they have similar data in the intermediate arm. Their intermediate arm doesn't quite look as good as the S3, but it's, again, non-inferior, looks just as good as surgery, and it's a very good system. Um, and they've gone through their three um, uh, reiterations, again, making uh, uh, improvements. It's now on a 14 French system. The Edwards system is on a 14 French system, so they're both the same. Um, this one has, you know, and so, you know, I guess the bottom line, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to each. The majority of patients, 70, 80 percent of patients, could receive either valve. Um, the, but there are some pluses to having a non volumen expandable system. Um, namely, some patients have a lot of calcium, either in the, or their aorta or the connection between the aortic valve and the left ventricle that can make it risky to inflate a balloon. You could, you know, calcium acts like an eggshell and it could crack, and if it cracks, that's a real problem. This has a nice um, controlled expansion. It doesn't, uh, 
crack or cause anything like that. So that's the big plus of this system. The big downside, the pacemaker rate's higher because it's bulkier and it does continue to expand. Um, the pacemaker rate is slightly higher with this system. Forward. And this talks a little bit about the, the pros and cons. And this is the, more the original system. Um, even the, the current core valve system, the delivery system, although they both say 14 French, the Edward system is slightly larger. Um, next slide. And this is just an animation to kind of understand what, what we're talking about. I, I'll, I'll be the audio because it's a little blurry. They're showing the femoral arteries here, and then that's the aorta. And you get access. Um, you go up with a wire across the, the heart valve into the left ventricle. And then you pass this sheath delivery system up into the aorta. And we don't have to do this as often um, as before, but in the, originally we would always do what's called a balloon aortic valvuloplasty. So we'd use a balloon to kind of open up the native valve so it'd be easier to cross. Um, we still do that if it's really critical and really tight because it's hard to get that delivery system across there. But if it's not that critical, um, then we try not to do that because it's just another ballooning, which you know, anytime you're doing more um, in the body, there's more risk. This shows the system going in. The balloon and the valve are actually separate. And then you pull, the, when you get inside, to keep it smaller, and when you get inside the body, you pull the balloon onto the valve. You cross on that wire that I was mentioning. What you don't see is a pacemaker, a temporary pacemaker that's in. We do rapid ventricular pacing to stabilize the system. That's why it looks like it's quivering. And then rapidly deploy the valve. Pull the balloon out, and you have an immediately functioning um, aortic, new aortic valve. And the old valves to the side, the hole over here is the coronary, one of the coronary arteries. You'll see one on the right side here in a moment, too. But, and you're looking on FOSS into the left ventricle there. That's the mitral valve you're seeing. Okay. So we do all this under fluoroscopy. So in this hybrid OR or cath lab, we have an x-ray tube that we can see. And these things are um, fluoroscopically apparent. So they're radio opaque. Um, so we can see it. And then go back one. There's, a, there's another video. This is just a really brief video actually showing what, we'll, what, what we see. So if you play this, um, that one doesn't want to open. OK, well, we won't see it then. <laughs> OK, next slide. It doesn't have a little play button there, Tori? I see. There we go. So and they, this is one of the early slides. This is a very rapid deployment. We usually do this under you know, five or six seconds as opposed to uh, half a second that, like they did. But you see the we can, you know, we can see the sheath over here. If you pause it there, um, you know our sheath is is here the, that 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 you saw, and then we can see it going up around the aorta. We can change our magnification to see where we're going. Um, this is what they call a pigtail catheter when we inject contrast to confirm we don't have a tear, we caused any problems, and to confirm there's not leakiness back into the aorta. So because that bulky calcified aortic valve is around it, um, there is a chance that there could be some space between this valve and your own valve, and then you can get some leakiness. If it's very mild, which most people have mild or what we call trace, very little, it's not of any consequence. If you have a lot of leakiness, it is of consequence. And people don't like that. They don't do well. So we try to avoid that. And that's why the valve design continues to improve to try to reduce that. And we've learned a lot over the last you know, eight years of, of the procedure, where to implant it, how to implant it, to, to make sure you're in the right spot and reduce the chances of that being a problem. OK, next slide. So now I'm going to change gears. And I know there's probably a lot of questions, and we'll save them to the end. 
Um, and talk, the, the rest of it will be a little shorter, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about mitral valve disease. How are we doing on time? So the mitral valve, it's a bit more complicated structure than the aortic valve. Um, so uh, it, it has two main leaflets, um, and it separates the left atrium from the left ventricle, but it has a lot of supporting structures. Um, and its normal function is when the left ventricle squeezes, it closes to prevent blood, blood from backflowing. Um, it, so it's under a tremendous amount of pressure uh, when that left ventricle is pushing blood out to the rest of our body. And then it opens, and the left ventricle, when it relaxes, it partially acts as a suction to pull blood in, but then also the left atrium contracts to push blood in there. As far as pathology, there's two main um, uh, pathologies for the mitral valve. You can get mitral stenosis. The most common reason for that is rheumatic uh, disease, so rheumatic fever. We don't see that very often here. Again, worldwide, it's still a very common problem, and this is the most common valve that it affects. Um, and then the, the thing I'm going to talk about is what's called mitral regurgitation. Regurgitation is leakiness or backflow of blood um, that can occur. And there's a variety of things that can lead to that, um, including degenerative things or um, functional things. Next slide. And this shows the complexities of the structure. Again, the mitral valves up top in white, those little parachute-looking um, uh, hanging things or jellyfish are really the chordae tendinae, though, the supporting structures to help um, prevent the valve from backflowing uh, or going, you know, going backwards. And then they're attached to these muscle heads called papillary muscles in the left ventricle itself. Um, and then this animation shows a normal functioning valve when it's closed on the left. And then in the, on the, the next slide or the next picture um, shows a degenerative valve where you have kind of, it's, it's um, the valve's myxomatous or, or kind of floppy. There's extra redundant tissue, and the chordae are a little bit floppy too, and so that redundant tissue can prolapse or go back, and that can lead to leakiness. That red that you're seeing is leakiness back in the left atrium. Um, those same patients or other things can lead to um, rupture of one of these chordae, or, and that leads to what's called a flail segment, and there's other conditions that can cause that, but then the mitral leaflet is just flopping. One of, the, one of those leaflets is flopping, and leads, usually that leads to really sudden uh, onset of symptoms. People go downhill um, rapidly. And then uh, on the right is what we call functional um, regurgitation. And that's usually, there's, again, there's other things that can cause it, but the most common is the left ventricle gets stretched and enlarged from either congestive heart failure or other conditions, and the valve leaflets are just not able to coapt. Next slide. The symptoms of severe mitral regurgitation, again, shortness of breath with exertion is probably the most common. Um, decreased exercise tolerance, some similarities to aortic stenosis in that regards. Um, palpitations, so as this leakiness happens over years, a lot of people, the left atrium will get enlarged, and that can lead to um, developing atrial fibrillation, a regular heart rhythm that usually originates from that left atrium. Um, and then other signs of heart failure, including leg swelling and trouble breathing at night, and things can also develop. Next slide. Murmurs, again, the classic finding. It's a different kind of sound. Murmurs are basically just turbulent flow that we hear, and there can be benign murmurs, um, and there's pathologic murmurs. And aortic stenosis and severe mitral regurgitation definitely give pathologic murmurs. Um, and then once that's seen, usually you're sent for an echocardiogram. The transthoracic echo, the echo on the surface of the chest, is the most common to, to pick it up. But sometimes we underestimate how bad it is. And if, if um, we're really concerned someone has problems with severe mitral regurgitation, we will send them for a transesophageal echo. That's rarely needed for aortic stenosis, um, but it's almost always needed for mitral regurgitation. And it has to do with a couple things. One is to confirm the severity of the stenosis. The other is it helps identify what the pathology is to help guide how to best treat it. Bottom line, if you're having symptoms with severe mitral regurgitation, you should have it fixed. If you're not having symptoms, even those folks um, need really close monitoring and scrutiny. And we look, we have all sorts of different criteria we look at on the, on the echocardiogram um, and based on the patient's symptoms and other history to see is the heart having any indication that it's failing. Because mitral regurgitation, the big thing is if you wait too long and the heart starts failing, you can have missed the boat. 
Um, and these folks don't recover uh, well if, if, if the heart starts failing. The, the treatment, the favored approach, is mit surgical mitral valve repair. So if it's a repairable valve, that degenerative one I was showing you, if, uh, if you can send them to a center that has a good surgeon, that gets a good, does a good job at mitral valve repair, that's the best thing. Mitral valve replacement, not benign, but some patients the valve is not repairable, and often they won't know until they get in there, but um, the problem with mitral valve re replacement is you have to cut all those chordal structures, those things that connect the valve to the left ventricle, and that leads to a different geometry of the left ventricle, and those folks don't do as well as the ones that get mitral valve repair, where you can preserve those subvalvular structures. And then kind of a newer thing again same thing this this condition gets more common as we get older and as, as we get older the risks of surgery go up for mitral valve surgery the risks are much higher in general compared to aortic valve surgery and it has to do with the complexities of the valve and, and um, things um, that are going on and so because of that again there's been um, new technology to look at how can we address it non-surgically um, and really, it was based on, you know, a, 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 this technology, this mitra clip that I'm going to go over a little bit, is based on a, um, a surgical technique by an Italian surgeon called Alfieri. And he noticed in valves that he couldn't properly repair, um, he di and he didn't want to open or do a full mitral valve replacement. He would put a stitch right in the center to create kind of a figure eight or a double orifice opening of the valve. And those folks did well, and it was based on that technique that this, this uh, clip came about. And this just kind of shows structural heart disease, all valve disease, as how it increases with age. The bottom line is aortic stenosis, and I'm sorry, the bottom line is actually increasing age, but the bottom line on that graph is showing aortic stenosis and how it does increase with age. Mitral valve disease is the second line, which you can see actually the prevalence of it is about twice as high as aortic valve disease. Next slide. The interesting thing, you've, which I showed you before, was aortic valve surgery accounts for you know, two-thirds of heart valve surgery. So even though mitral valve disease is twice more common, this mitral regurgitation, it's less commonly operated on. And because it's, it's a complex um, issue and the risks of surgery are, are, are higher. So if you look at total patients with any degree of MR, it's 4 million. The number that have moderate to severe MR, it's about 1.7 million, um, with an annual incidence of about 250,000 people. Um, the number of mitral valve surgeries a year, about 30,000. And so it's a huge un unserved population for a variety of different reasons. Next slide. Um, but we know untreated, it does lead to increased morbidity, mainly heart failure and hospitalization for it, as well as mortality. Next slide. And this shows some data in, in Europe. The number of folks on the bottom is, again, increasing age. So the number of folks that have the disease continues to increase as they get older. The number of them that the decision is not to operate, whether it's the patient or the surgeon, gets higher as they get older, again, because of comorbidities and the increased risk of surgery. Next slide. And we know, you know medically managed patients, um, you know, it's a serious condition. Five-year mortality is about 50%. Um, FMR is functional mitral regurgitation. Um, and you can see even less of those folks get surgery. DMR, degenerative. That's where there's a pathologic issue with the valve. A lot more of those get surgery. Next slide. Um, so this mitral clip, again, it's used for moderate to severe MAR, and it's an alternative to surgery for patients that are high risk and not good candidates for an open operation. Um, next slide. And basically what it involves is um, putting a, a large catheter or tube through the vein in this case, as opposed to the artery, um, through the groin, and going up to the right side of the heart. So the mitral valve, you say, how do you get to the right side? I mean, the, the mitral valve from the right side. So they go up to the right atrium, and between the atrium, there's a little space called the septum, a little division, and they actually make a little hole in there and pass their tubes and catheters into the left atrium so that they can then uh, access the mitral valve. Um, 
And this kind of shows the, the delivery system is on the left side, and it shows, you know, you're sitting in the left atrium with this device. These people are asleep. They have a TE probe, a special echocardiogram that we can see all these structures um, real closely. And then you put the clip down, um, cinch up the valve leaflets to create these two orifices to reduce that degree of leakiness that occurs. Next slide. And with this um, technique, there's been several studies, um, but basically you, what we've seen is reduction in heart failure symptoms that's been fairly dr dramatic and sustained, as well as hospitalization for heart failure. Next slide. Um, next slide. And then I'm not going to show that, that, that video um, was much longer. It's about four minutes. So you can look at it online if you're interested. If you look up MitroClip, um, the company has a website, nice, uh, about a four, four and a half minute video that really goes through it. So lastly, I'll finish up here with atrial fibrillation, uh, talking briefly about it. Next slide. Um, atrial fibrillation is a, actually a, an arrhythmia, an irregular heart rhythm um, that occurs. Again, increasing prevalence with age. It affects um, so what happens is our normal electrical system, we have kind of our own pacemaker that sends signals to tell the top chambers to beat. Then that goes down and tells the bottom chambers to beat through, through that electrical system. With atrial fibrillation, what happens is there's a bunch of extra pacemakers that kind of take over, and they're making the, the top chambers beat um, erratically and very fast, four, five, six hundred beats a minute. And instead of pumping, they're fibrillating or quivering. Um, and that leads to two things. One, now fortunately, not all those signals get down to the bottom chambers because we have kind of our own little governor in our electrical system. But about every third or fourth signal gets down. The heart rate can still be fast with this. And we can use meds to slow that down. But the other thing is when the, the heart's fibrillating like that, blood can pool, clot can form. And it's one of the leading causes of stroke as we get older because if that clot breaks loose, it could go up to the brain and cause a stroke. Next slide. Um, incident, it affects nearly 5 million Americans. Uh, again, it rises with age with upwards of 15% of folks in their 80s um, with this condition. Um, there are risk factors for it, high blood pressure, um, mitral valve disease, diabetes, uh, you know, other, you know, other um, uh, heart conditions can lead to um, a more likelihood of developing atrial fibrillation. And it mentions the two issues, rate and rhythm control and clot and stroke prevention are the two, two areas of concern. Next slide. Um, as far as folks' risk for stroke um, depends on a variety of things, and we use this thing called this Chad's Vast Calculator, but basically we, it's a check mark, and the, the more points you have, the more of these conditions you have, the higher your risk of stroke. All you need are two points, and in general if you have two points, it's recommended you take a, a strong blood thinner like Warfarin or Coumadin, or these newer ones you see on TVs, or Alto, Eliquis, those things. Next slide. And the most common place for clot to form with atrial fibrillation is a little dog ear that comes off the left atrium called the left atrial appendage. So we all have one. We, they can be different sizes. Um, but 90% of clots are believed to form there. Next slide. Uh, what I'm not going to go into, this talks about rate and rhythm control. There's a variety of treatments. Meds are usually the first-line therapy. Um, folks that fail meds, there are more aggressive therapies that can be done to try to keep them out of atrial fibrillation. But the majority of folks um, uh, tolerate AFib as long as you have them on meds to keep their heart rate from going fast. Next slide. As far as the slot, um, sorry, clot or stroke prevention, uh, I mentioned the blood thinners. Um, the issue is many of these folks, or many folks as we get older, have some contraindications to blood thinners. There's even folks that just either occupation or hobbies, um, they don't want to be on blood thinners. They do skydiving or they do rock climbing or they do other things that make them, um, you know, they say, I don't want to be on blood thinners. Well, if they have risk factors for stroke, you're caught in this quandary. Observational data from uh, surgery, so uh, the surgeons um, have been cutting out the um, left atrial appendage in folks that are having an operation for other reasons, so they're already having open heart surgery. If they're there for their mitral valve, if they're there for their bypass surgery and they have atrial fibrillation, a lot of times they were 
ligating the left atrial appendage because the feeling was this is where clots form, let's, let's take care of it, we're already there. Um, and data from that showed a significant reduction in stroke. And so it was really based on that that a variety of devices have been looked at to see are there ways we can, we can do this um, percutaneously. Surgery is still one way that it's done, and folks that need ablation procedures surgically or, or have another kind of uh, heart surgery, this is, that's certainly uh, one way. But there's a, a less um, invasive approach, uh, and that's this device called the Watchman. That's the only FDA-approved device thus far. Next slide. Um, this picture mainly, uh, the reason I put it in there, it shows a nice um, left atrial appendage that's down here. The left atrium is actually above. So this little sac is the left atrial appendage. It actually shows a clot that's, that's formed in there. This is what we would see under a transesophageal echo. Next slide. This Watchman device is also made of nitinol. Um, and it, it basically has these little bar, uh, bars on the, the bottom that go into the left atrial appendage. And then this little felt, or not felt, but the material on the surface um, to kind of exclude the left atrial appendage. And what happens uh, over... Any of our vascular system, when you put foreign bodies in it or disrupt that vascular system, it will grow a lining of cells called endothelium. So it heals and covers it back up. That endothelium is normally there. We disrupt it when we're doing procedures, and then it will normally cover it up. And the idea behind this is you put this uh, device in, and over time it will be covered up with endothelium and really exclude that left atrial appendage, and by doing that reduce um, the risk of stroke. And what they saw was, compared to uh, Coumadin, it was just as effective in terms of stroke uh, reduction. And in fact, for hemorrhagic stroke, which is a less common but bleeding type stroke that happens in the brain, is dramatically um, um, better because they're not on blood thinners. Next slide. In this, similar to that mitral clip procedure, um, is done through a similar approach where you go through the vein you get access to the left atrium by going across the intraatrial septum uh, with your catheter. And again, this is done under um, transesophageal echo guidance. And then there's different sizes of these devices depending on the, the size of the left atrial appendage. And then you put this device in. You confirm that you're happy. And once you're happy with it, then you can deploy it. Or um, Next slide. And this shows, um, this is just data from the, the Watchman studies that have been done. The top line is patients with untreated, they're not on you know, anticoagulation, and their risk of stroke. And it, the, the risk of ischemic stroke goes up. Per, you know, so over time, over years, um, it will go up. The black line is the folks that are on anticoagulation. And then all these little arrows or, or triangles or the different studies with, with the Watchman device showing that it's basically non-inferior, you know, similar results or better results than being on anticoagulation. In these high-risk patients that, you know, had contraindications to blood thinners. The other advantage, obviously, if you're not on a blood thinner long-term, then is your risk of serious bleeding is, is lower in the Watchman group versus folks that stayed on traditional blood thinners. So blood thinners we know aren't benign um, either. Next slide. And this is a short little video. Hopefully it will play. This is the Watchman implant a one-time procedure that may reduce your stroke risk for a lifetime. In people with atrial fibrillation, blood clots most commonly form in a part of the heart called the left atrial appendage or LAA. If a clot escapes, it can cut off the blood supply to the brain, causing a stroke. Closing the left atrial appendage is an effective way to reduce stroke risk in people with AFib not caused by heart valve problems. Watchman is the only implant approved by the FDA to do exactly this. Watchman can be a life-changing alternative to the daily use of blood thinners and the bleeding risks that come with them. Talk to your cardiologist so you fully understand all the benefits and risks of Watchman. See if Watchman is right for you. Learn more at Watchman.com. Okay, 
next slide. And that's it. It just says, pull out, Betty, pull out. You hit an artery. <laughs> okay. I, I'll open it up for questions. So this TAVR business, um, we have a team, and that's the one thing I, I'll have to say, you know, interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery have always had kind of a, a, a battling relationship for years, um, you know, dating back to the, the 80s when angioplasty and stent procedures began. And interestingly enough, with these new technologies, um, you know, really TAVR, being the, the, the main uh, guiding light, it's really brought us closer together now. And most places, both our governing bodies encourage it, but most places, um, I'm closer to my heart surgeons now than I ever was in training um, because we, we form what we call these heart teams. So we work with heart surgeons. We, a lot of places have, like ours, have a valve clinic or other places where you really have a form where you talk about cases with your surgeons as opposed to just, oh, I see a blockage, I'm just going to stick a stent in it. Oh, I see aortic stenosis, I'm just going to go stick a TAVR in them. Um, it's really a, a multidisciplinary approach where um, surgeons, non-invasive cardiologists, and interventional cardiologists get together, kind of put their heads together and decide what's the best thing for this patient. Um, so that's, I'll, I'll, I'll just start it with that. And that's been true for all these other procedures. Um, you know, I helped start our TAVR program in 2013. When I was in training, we didn't have structural fellowships. So with all these technologies now, most interventional cardiologists will go on, uh, not most, some of them will go on to do another year or two of just structural training to learn these different techniques. Um, and we've been fortunate enough, we have um, a person from Duke uh, named Sharif Aleem. He's structurally trained, and he's really brought these, devi these new tools to us, including Watchmen, and um, the mitra clip. So we've been doing it about two years now at Presbyterian, getting excellent outcomes. He's doing a great job, um, and he's really elevated um, the care we can provide to patients here in New Mexico. How long does the valve last? So that's a good question. Um, the problem has to do with data lag. And so if you look at um, the lab data, you know, the, the lab testing has been done for the number of cycles that would be equivalent of 15 to 20 years. And in the lab, it looks wonderful, um, up to 15 to 20 years. The companies that make these valves are the same companies that make the surgical valves. So they know what they're doing. They know how to design a valve. But the honest truth, we don't know in, in the body. What we do know, the original partner trial, um, we do have um, five and six year data, and they look very durable. The problem is the numbers are small. These patients were old and sick, and so the numbers that are actually alive five and six years out are even smaller. Um, and so that's one of the, the big question marks, you know, in these intermediate risk patients. Um, intermediate risk is a broad range. Um, and one of the th discussions we have is, yeah, the advantage of this procedure is you don't have to be on cardiopulmonary bypass, you don't have to have a sternotomy, you leave the hospital in a few days, your recovery's faster, but we don't know is this gonna last 10 or 20 years. An open uh, aortic valve replacement, most of those surgical valves tend to last anywhere from, the surgeons will say 10 to 20 years, I think it's more 10 to 15 years. So they do tend to be fairly durable, and we hope that these TAVR valves are gonna be that durable, we just don't know. So um, as it gets more severe, the pressure in the left ventricle is actually increasing, whereas the pressure on the outside um, will often stay stable. So um, it doesn't necessarily, it, so if you're thinking, it's, does it cause high blood pressure? No, it doesn't cause high blood pressure, but it does put a tremendous amount of pressure on the heart. When we, we check pressures directly when we do these cases, um, in someone with aortic stenosis, for example, 
they may have an 80 millimeter peak to peak gradient across that valve. So if I'm in the left ventricle, that pressure might be 240. And then the aorta, which is where their blood pressure you're checking in their arm is, it might only be 160, um, which is still high, but there's a tremendous pressure that's being generated in the left ventricle. Um, I'm not sure that you can't do those, the, the push-ups or weightlifting. Um, you know, the thing we worry about, I think, anytime you have um, serious vascular conditions, a lot of folks would discourage um, really strenuous, like heavy lifting, um, because you're doing breath holding. And when you breath hold and strain, pressures go up. Well, when your left ventricular pressure is 200, and now you're breath holding and straining in your pressure's 300, that's probably not good. So that may be why um, you're being advised not to do re really straight. But I think light to moderate lifting is probably fine, making sure you don't breath hold, don't strain. So what is the time frame that Tabber will be offering young patients so that they can, you know, how young should they be gone so far? I mean, we've done, um, you know, as, as young as, Rarely folks in their 20s or 30s, but these, those are probably two or three cases total out of our 300-plus uh, experience. And those are really congenital heart patients that have had six and seven operations that the pediatric heart surgeon says, I, I don't want to operate on this person again. This, you know, this is you know, there's, there's, there's just too much. Um, as far as the traditional population we're talking about, I mean, in general, 60s or 70s, and that's also very rare. It's usually people that have some other serious comorbid condition that makes them not a good candidate for an open operation. An example might be someone with um, prior uh, lymphoma that had chest radiation, um, someone on chronic steroids that really had, their tissue is really friable, the surgeons worry about operating on them. Or rarely even we see some 70-year-olds know, seven, with that are heavy smokers have what we call a porcelain aorta, kind of the aorta is heavily calcified, and they don't have a spot they could cross clamp. They would, they would want to do TAVR versus doing an open operation. As far as you know, low risk patients, again, right now, you can't do it. So we have patients come in our office that are 75, say uh, they're active, they feel good, say, I want a TAVR, I don't want an open operation, I want to get back on my feet, go back to work, go, go, go do things. We can't, by FDA rules, we can't, we can't put a TAVR in, in that person. Um, we, we've sent a couple of those folks to centers like Scripps in San Diego or Dallas um, to get evaluated. And in those cases, for, because there, there is a tr clinical trial that's uh, enrolling patients for that, but you're randomized. So you may show up at Scripps and they say, they put you in the computer and the computer says you're getting surgery. Well, you're getting surgery. Um, but you could get TAVR. Yeah, so most of these patients are Medicare patients, and yes, it's covered by insurance. The valve itself is, is quite expensive. Um, compared to a surgical valve, um, uh, you know, a surgical valve runs anywhere from four to $8,000. Uh, these TAVR valves are close to $30,000. That's what the company charges for it. Um, as far as the billing, um, the hospital has kind of billing codes for if they do an open operation versus TAVR, and they're actually very similar because it's really your, the valve condition that's the problem. So the hospital just doesn't make as much money um, by, by doing these TAVR procedures. So there are a lot of places the hospital's not happy about TAVR programs um, because, of, because of the, the, you know, it's generally, it's not a money-making kind of uh, uh, money-maker as opposed to an open operation. But it's certainly what's, what's, it's the wave of the future. And, you know, I think over time cost hopefully will come down. The, you know, we, we bug, uh, you know, our, our valve people all the time and say, you, you, you can't keep charging this. And they, their argument is if we reduce the price, Medicare will reduce your reimbursement. And we say, we don't care. At least it's better for the system. You know, ultimately that's what, what we want is cost savings for the system. Good to see you.